The Global Conservation Corps presents the Rhino Man podcast. I'm John Jerko, your host and one of the directors of Rhino Man the Movie. This podcast series is a way for me to interview top conservationists on the topics of rhinos, the poaching crisis, the importance of rangers, and community engagement. All as a way to create awareness around these issues and to promote the coming release of our documentary film. In this episode, I'm talking with Sophie Green. Sophie is an award-winning conservation and wildlife artist from the UK who specializes in capturing photorealistic details. Sophie has dedicated her time and artistic work to raising funds and awareness for issues surrounding animal welfare and the environment, and has worked closely with foundations such as the International Fund for Animal Welfare, the David Shepard Wildlife Foundation, and Explorers Against Extinction. Sophie was awarded the Medal of Excellence by the Artists for Conservation Foundation in 2021, was the winner of the Leisure Painter People's Choice Award in 2020 and 2021, was runner-up in the BBC Wildlife magazine People's Choice, and was selected to be one of 20 artists to exhibit at COP26 in the Blue Zone. In this conversation, we talk about Sophie's winding journey into a career of painting and supporting conservation efforts. We dive into her challenges with selective mutism in her youth and how she worked through her anxiety. We talk about her development as an artist, how she came back to art after a hiatus, and her leap from teacher to professional artist. We discuss Sophie's recent impermanence collection, her artistic style, her love of travel, and the impact she strives to have with her work. It's a wonderful, wide-ranging conversation. Before we jump in, I'd like to ask you to please subscribe to and rate the show on your favorite podcast platform, and to share it on social media and with your friends. With your support, the Rhino Man podcast can grow. Now, without further ado, here's my conversation with Sophie Green. Hi, Sophie. Welcome to the Rhino Man podcast. It's a real honor to have you on here. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be here. Yeah, I think I got connected to your work through, I don't know if I was just like clicking on Instagram or what and came across the the beautiful painting you did of the two white rhinos, the mother and calf. I don't. I think you have it titled as Sabike. I don't yes, know if yeah. that's how you pronounce it. Is it a Zulu word? I was trying to look it up to figure it out. Yeah, so that piece was actually a commission. So mm. it, it went alongside its sort of count, counterpart, which was the elephant, a mother and baby. Yeah. And it was named by the person that bought the commission, commissioned the piece. I believe, uh, I always get confused between the two names, but I believe it's it means... I will care for you or something like that. It has a very sweet yeah. meaning. But yeah, I might have got that totally wrong. But yeah, I've, I've painted so many pieces in the last year. I, I forget. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it's a very, very popular piece. Yeah, you have an incredible portfolio of beautiful pieces. And I just want to say thank you for, for, for doing this interview. I, I also saw that you've been just kind of blowing up all over the place in terms of, you know, mm-hmm. you have CNN interviews and Nat Geo and... It's really a big podcast there in the UK. So yeah, Mm. it seems like you're really getting out there in a big way. Yeah, I think I've been really lucky because I I had my exhibition last year in London and it was uh, to showcase my impermanence collection. Mm. So I had a lot of sort of interest around that and, and people sort of saw my artwork through that lens of conservation and using my artwork to make a difference because that's sort of how I've always tried to tried to sort of position my work in terms of making a difference in the natural world so I think I think given the sort of current climate crisis and everything that's going on in the world people seem to take notice I think Mm. my artwork's quite palatable in that way in that it has a message but it's not sort of really grim and heartbreaking or anything like that it's still quite pleasant to look at and so people enjoy looking at it but they can also enjoy the sort of elements of um, conservation behind it as well. Yeah, and I think that I really want to dive into a, a lot of what you just said in terms of your work and the connection to conservation and the impermanence collection as well. There's some pieces that really stand out, especially the watcher, that wild dog, mm. just the, the face on that thing just draws you in. And they're, they're one of my favorite animals. So I want to get into all of that, but I think it'll be fun to, to kind of go back a little bit into how you got into this whole world and maybe just starting out as, you know, where you grew up as a kid, were there any interests that kind of started out early on that led you towards the path of painting or conservation you know looking back what are some of those early formative years like 
Yeah, so I grew up in a place called Surrey in the UK, which is kind of like a leafy suburb of London. It's one of the outer counties of London and I had, you know, fairly normal upbringing. I lived in kind of like semi-rural area, big garden and kind of backed onto some woods and spent a lot of time outdoors in nature. I Well, from the age of sort of three until seven, I had a severe kind of anxiety disorder called selective mutism so I couldn't physically speak and that for me manifested in just going into myself and kind of spending a lot of time alone out in nature I was absolutely obsessed with animals a lot of my sort of weekends were spent like reading animal encyclopedias and like making fact files and stuff like that so I've always been innately passionate about animals and wildlife and nature I don't think the kind of passion for art was very natural or innate for me. I think that kind of just came along quite gradually. I sort of drew and painted and stuff for fun as a kid, as most children sort of do when we're given that opportunity to be creative as children. But yeah, it wasn't until I was sort of like an adult in later life that I decided to really go for it as a career. It was never really a like a, a dream for me to be an artist. It kind of happened quite organically. But yeah, yeah, I would say that the the animals and the nature and the wildlife, that for me was always there. I sort of sought solace in nature and wildlife. And then as the years went on and I kind of overcame my selective mutism, it stuck with me. And yeah, so it was always, always animals, always nature. I studied art until I was perhaps 16, up until we have our GCSEs in the UK. So I guess the possibly similar to like your SATs or something mm -hmm. and then yeah after 16 I, I gave up because I, I wasn't really remotely interested in kind of learning about different styles and techniques and art history and stuff <laughs> like that I just kind of wanted to do what I wanted to do and that was draw and paint animals and that's what I kind of did as a hobby for many years I used to sort of just paint at home on the living room floor with my older brother who is a very talented artist and he kind of taught me what I know today and then I went and worked in the film industry for a number of years and then went and became a primary school teacher which is like elementary school mm -hmm. and then decided I would finally try and pursue a career in the arts and it, luckily for me it kind of all it all worked out well and I succeeded and here I am today. Yeah I'd really like to dive back into you know your early days you're saying you had selective mutism and I just remember being I feel like all the men in my family, I don't know if it's genetic or what, were very shy when they were young. <laughs> I know I, I was really shy myself and just, uh, yeah, it was, it was tough to, to kind of express myself or, you know, say mm -hmm. things. I know my, my brother, he used to, when he was like five years old, he would literally yell out, don't look at me. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> it's like the beginning of that song by uh, <laughs> Christina Aguilera or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's hilarious. But I think through that, it is interesting because, you know, I think for myself on the creative side, it kind of allowed me to go into my own worlds. And for me, that was kind of a combination of, you know, building constructs, or, which were kind of like these block things or mm. drawing and writing little stories and things like that. And all stuff that somehow I'm doing in different ways today, which is kind of amazing because, you know, you never really plan that kind of stuff when you're young. No, it's, I think it's like a really good indicator of what your authentic self mm. loves is what you were naturally drawn to as a child of what you enjoyed doing. And for you, it sounds like creation is on being creative is one of them and nature. And for me as well as nature and, and creation, um, I used to build dens like outside in the garden. That was like one of my biggest hobbies was like creating <laughs> a den. And I remember me and my friends would all like, you know, like you'd get sticks and leaves and stuff like that. And you'd create like a little house at, like behind a tree or something. Yeah. And it's all about creating. And yeah. And so I've just kind of followed that throughout my whole life and ended up doing what I love. And I think it's a good way of sort of like pinpointing what you're good at and what you love and what you're passionate about. Hmm. Do you remember any of those books that you were you were interested in as a kid? You said you had some like animal encyclopedias. I know I mm. vividly remember the cover can't remember the name of it, but this like green book that another, you know, favorite thing of mine growing up was somewhat similar, but just, you know, finding bugs and collecting bugs and just always being outside on the ground, like observing these little insects. 
And I had, I remember every time we'd go to vacation in the summers, we'd go down to Myrtle Beach, which is in South Carolina. And I would get oh, this, yeah. I would be in the back of the car, like reading this book and trying to figure out, okay, what kind of sea life might I see down there? And so yeah, just kind of curious if you remember any of those books or, you know, how you interacted with them. Yeah. So it was, it was encyclopedias as well when, when mm. we were kids. I, mean, I don't know how old you are, but we're probably similar generation before like Wikipedia and like Googling things was yeah, an option. Still books. <laughs> yeah. It was always like the Encyclopedia Britannica and stuff like that. And uh, for me, it was always mm -hmm. cats. So I, I was absolutely obsessed with cats and I used to like research all the different breeds and I used to make fact files. And because I was sort of like the weird kid at school as well, I remember we didn't have a computer at home at the time, but the school had a computer. I think it was like a new thing, like this new technology and everyone was really excited about it. And, you know, everyone was kind of fighting to get on it. But because I was the weird kid whose parents got brought in quite a lot to talk, you know, they had to discuss like what was wrong with me and stuff. So after school had finished, my parents would come in for like a meeting and I would get to go on the computer. So I just have memories of like sitting on the computer after school when everyone had left and I was like researching cats and like looking at pictures of cats and then I would print the pictures out and cut them out and make a little fact file and stuff like that and then my parents actually ended up buying the family a cat a little kitten and I was absolutely <laughs> besotted and obsessed and he ended up absolutely hating me because I was like always <laughs> trying to grab him and spend time with him and start forcing him to be in the room with You're me. You're smothering him with love. <laughs> yeah yeah exactly I just wanted him to love me. But yeah, so it was it was the good old days. It was the good old days before like phones and TVs and technology took over our lives. And so the only thing you could really do back then was go out in nature and play and play with your friends. And, and there was more of a sense of connection and connection with others, connection with nature, connection with yourself. Like, I feel very sort of blessed to have been brought up at a time like that before everybody got glued to their screens. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I'm still pretty old school. I, I still love books and just be able to draw on them and you know, write notes in the corner. And there's something about just like flipping through pages and discovering things in something like an encyclopedia that's really hard to do mm. with, you know, an online textbook or something like that. It's it's kind of difficult. So, and I love the, that you were doing fact files. Is that what you call them? <laughs> <laughs> fact files. I don't know what you would yeah. call them in America. Um, uh, little, I don't know. You know, you'd have like a picture of the animal, and then you'd have little facts mm -hmm. about it, and you'd like, yeah, the weight of them, like how old they live to, like how long they're pregnant for, or whatever, whatever it might be. <laughs> Just information, gestation periods. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, yeah. That was a, yeah, it's a strange child. You were creating Wikipedia before Wikipedia was even around, basically. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I should have uh, <laughs> patented that. <laughs> <laughs> How did you overcome that? I don't know if you're you're willing to talk about that at all, because I know for me as a child, you know, I think every once in a while it still kind of comes up in your adult life, or at least for me, is that whatever that shyness is or that anxiety around, you know, having to speak in front of someone or, you know, that's, I think part of the reason that I'm podcasting is because, you know, I, I want to overcome that. And, mm -hmm. and I think there's, you know, you see so much value in having deep conversations with people and how much that can really make life more beautiful if you can open up to it but it can be a challenge for people to to overcome that yeah definitely god i'm so grateful that i did overcome it because i know you know some people suffer from it their entire lives every time i do an interview and i mention the mutism i always get messages and emails from people afterwards sort of saying like my daughter's mm. got it or my niece has got it or I've got it, whoever, and sometimes they'll be in their 20s, 30s. You know, it, it's not always the case that people can overcome it in childhood. And I feel so blessed to have been able to overcome it because anxiety is something that I've lived with my whole life and I still have anxiety in other ways. It kind of manifests in other ways. And it's something I absolutely hate, but I'm so grateful that it doesn't manifest in that way anymore because my whole life would be completely different and I wouldn't be able to do all of the things that I do today. But um, to be honest with you, I was so young, I was only seven and I had a very supportive network of people around me. My friends were very supportive. My family was very supportive. I don't 
I don't really remember anyone ever putting much pressure on me to speak. I think the closest I came mm -hmm. was my sister, my older sister always used to say like, when you move up to, because we had sort of infant school and junior school back then. Nowadays you get mostly sort of like primary schools where it, it all rolls mm -hmm. into one. But I went to separate infant and junior and I was just about to move up to my junior school. And I remember my sister being like, you know, if you don't talk, then you're going to get bullied when you go to junior school. <laughs> and uh, like trying to put the fear of God in me kind of thing. <laughs> Adding some extra pressure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And and that was the only sort of pressure that I remember ever really getting from my family. I mean, I was bullied at school because I was the weird kid, but for the most part, I had good friends and, and I remember the teachers were very kind and they sort of allowed me to stay in at playtime and lunchtime sometimes and like choose a friend to sit in with me and hoping that I might talk. But I think for that friend, it was probably just like a bit, a bit boring sitting in at playtime or lunchtime with the child that doesn't speak. Mm. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I think it was sort of a gradual thing. And I think I kind of managed to get the, I wouldn't say bravery, because it's not even like a bravery thing. I just kind of got the courage to speak a couple of times and then they ended up bringing in the whole school when I spoke for the first time and then they got me to read a story to everybody and I sat down and read a story to the whole school and it was really like a baptism of fire. It was absolutely terrifying. Well, but yeah. They threw me in at the deep end and that was that. And then I couldn't really go back because everybody had heard me speak and I was still a shy child, but I didn't have selective mutism. Yeah. Well, that's a heck of an experience. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, just reading in front of your class is enough, let alone the entire school coming in. So yeah. it's like exposure therapy, basically. Oh, God. And a whole story yeah. as well. I remember like when mm. we used to be in class and we would be reading a book as a class and you'd get called on to like read a line and your heart would be racing. <laughs> and uh, yeah, to sit and read an entire story in front of the whole school. I mean, it was a small school. It was like a small little village school. So it wasn't, yeah. it wasn't hundreds and hundreds of children, but still <laughs> quite nerve wracking. Yeah. Everyone's here for you. Get ready. <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is your moment. I suppose it was preparing me for podcasts and stuff. Mm, yeah, been doing a lot of presenting in different ways over the last couple of years. So, yeah. And I think what was interesting too, you know, reading a little bit of, of your history online and, and listening to some other podcasts is, you know, there's the selective mutism, but then you decide to become a, a primary school teacher, which I feel like for me almost sounds terrifying, like getting up in front of I don't I don't know why I have this like little fear of losing control of kids and then it yeah. becomes like one of these like problem child or one of those movies where the kids take over and this the teacher's yeah. like what's happening but I don't uh, know you know yeah. talk about that decision and how you got into that role yeah well it's like kindergarten cop isn't it I, I suppose actually to be fair it's funny you say that because that's become one of my stress streams like whenever I'm stressed in other aspects of my life I have a dream that I'm back teaching my old class mm. and they're just running a mock. So it's either that <laughs> or it's like a tsunami dream because I just, yeah, have a fear of uh, deep, deep water. Mm. But um, yeah, the teaching for me, to be honest with you, I was working in the film industry and I think my dad at the time made some comment like, oh, you're going to have to go and get a real job soon or something. Mm. And, uh, Love when parents do that. Yeah, I know. Even that. though I was kind of like doing what I loved and I was earning good money. I suppose I wasn't really doing what I was doing. I was, I was doing like body doubling and standing mm -hmm. in for actresses and stuff. And I suppose that's in some ways not really a career or, you know, I suppose you could make a career out of it, but it would be very difficult because, you know, being self-employed is difficult in the best of times. But doing that sort of work, it, it's not always reliable. So I kind of got what he was saying, but I just panicked and was like, okay, well, I like kids. My mum was a teacher. I guess I'll just go become a teacher. So went to university for three years in my 20s as a mature student and then became a teacher. And then I was in my first year of teaching when I sort of realised that it definitely wasn't for me. And at this point, I think I'd always kind of been painting and drawing and stuff on on the side of whatever I was doing at the time. And then it, when I became a teacher, I didn't have any free time anymore. I didn't have time to do any of my hobbies. And I think that was what sort of pushed me to, to decide to actually go mm. for being an artist. And a few people had also said to me like, oh, you should be an artist. You should do this. So, yeah, if I decided to to go for it. And then I spent the next few years, I was still teaching and tutoring on on the side in the evenings and stuff and and building up my portfolio of work and 
and painting and doing little commissions and stuff. And then, yeah, after a few years, I, I was able to sort of make that jump into a full time teacher. So the rest is history. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, teaching jobs, you know, just from friends in the US, I don't know how it is in the UK. You know, some people are like, oh, the hours look really great. But then there's all the preparation work that you have to do. And I feel like a lot of times teachers just aren't as well taken care of as they should be because, you know, they're basically shaping the next generation, <laughs> which I think yeah. is kind of important. Yeah, I have a lot of respect for people that teach because it's ridiculous. Like, you know, you think you get the holidays off, but you end up working through most of them. And you work in the evenings, you take books home with you to mark and you're planning and doing all the data entry and stuff and all the boring stuff. And then you also kind of take the job home with you. Like you'll be lying in bed at night and you'll be like, oh, I don't think so-and-so took his glasses home or like, oh, I forgot <laughs> to give so-and-so his lunch. Like, and you just, you're constantly, you know, it's like being a parent to 30 children and you just don't get a free minute. So for me, it wasn't for me, but I, I do have a lot of respect for the people that are still able to do that. Yeah. Was there anxiety going into that classroom for the first few times or throughout it? I mean, you said you still have nightmares about it. So it's <laughs> just curious. I mean, I think I have nightmares because the moments when I was teaching were the most stressful moments of my life. And so I do often go back to that when I'm dreaming <laughs> and I'm stressed. Yeah. But to be honest with you, like, no, no anxiety around teaching. It is different. I think quite a lot of people they think that if you're not good at public speaking or you're not particularly confident as a person that you'll struggle, but it's completely different. So talking to a class full of children when you're the adult and they're all looking up at you and, you know, they, they all respect you is completely easy compared to speaking to a room full of adults. I'd take talking to kids any day. Like, I mean, I've <laughs> totally lost my teacher's voice now. I used to have like a lovely little teacher's voice. Yeah. And now I've just become like my normal cynical self <laughs> over the years. <laughs> <laughs> well, getting on to the painting and, and that side of things. How, so you said you were, you were taking some painting classes. I don't, is it part of the education system in the UK that you can take art or... Yeah. You know, how did how did you kind of get into it to begin with? So up until kind of primary, no, sorry, up until about the age of, I want to say like 13, 14 or something, you take art as part of the like national curriculum. So it's, it's in there, you have to take it. And then when you get to a certain age in secondary school, when you're a teenager, you get to choose your like options of what you want to go on and study. I mean, that's presuming it's still the same now. It might have completely changed since I was in school, but I chose art as one of my subjects because I just enjoyed doing it. So I chose it and studied it up until 16. And then I had probably had like a couple of lessons a week or something where you kind of got taught all about other artists, like, oh, this mm -hmm. is the work of Salvador, Salvador Dali and this is this style and, and you would practice doing different things. And I just was not interested. I was just always like talking and messing around and like <laughs> chatting with friends and stuff and getting told off. And then, yeah. And then after secondary school, I thought, yeah, I don't want to pursue this any, any further. So I dropped it at college and went on and studied some other subjects, but I was always kind of doing it alongside other stuff just for fun and sort of still painting with my brother. So kind of always had that within me, but um, I just never liked being told what to paint and what to do and what to study. I just wanted to do my own thing, which I think is quite common with, with creatives, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think you can, I don't know, for me at least, if I'm not working on something I want to <laughs> in a creative mm -hmm. sense, you kind of lose... It starts to feel like a job and then you lose that passion for it, which I feel like to do a lot of this kind of work, you need you need that energy. Otherwise, it, it can be really, really tough to push through oh, yeah. on some of these things. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, when I first started as an artist, the, f the first way that most artists kind of get their bread and butter money is through doing commissions, which is great. And commissions are great for like teaching you lots about the art world and you know, developing your style and your technique. But um, to be honest with you, I love certain commissions, like for example, the rhino and the rhino baby and the elephant and mm. the elephant baby that we talked about earlier are great. You know, they were great commissions for me. I was given quite a, quite a lot of creative freedom to do what I wanted to do. It was obviously like species that I'm interested in. When I first started out, I was doing like pet portraits and stuff like that. And even though I loved doing them for the <laughs> owner and I loved 
you know, seeing the owner's response and ma- making them happy and everything. I don't have a personal connection with someone's pet. So for me, I'm not passionate about that. I'm not, you know, like getting excited to do it in the morning. And I would find myself like procrastinating and dragging my heels a little bit. And then I had to ask myself, you know, I quit teaching for this reason exactly like I was doing mm-hmm. exactly the same sort of behaviors in my other job. So why have I quit teaching to go and do something else that I'm also not a hundred percent enjoying? So yeah, I had to kind of like make the difficult decision to stop doing commissions unless it was something that I really felt passionate about. Yeah, And I expected the whole world to like crumble beneath me and my career to like come crashing down. But actually the minute I cleared space, for the stuff that I was passionate about and put energy into all of that sort of stuff, I actually ended up kind of getting even even more sort of successful and my career blossomed a little bit, I think. Yeah, it's really exciting. And I think, yeah, if you don't have connection to the work you're doing, then it can kind of feel like, and maybe you went through this, like why why did I just ruin the thing that I loved by turning it into a job instead of just, you know, mm. it's, you'd almost rather it stay as a hobby rather than, than kind of, kill it in that way I think at least for me oh definitely yeah yeah absolutely I'm sure lots of creatives can kind of relate yeah Uh, I want to jump into the painting but just thinking about this you know you said you you did some work in the film world I I was listening and heard that you know you did some body doubling for (laughs) some Bond girls and some other films but when when you what was the initial impetus for going into the film side of things was it was it a creative urge were you getting into it for that reason or was it something that you kind of stumbled into and did for a while just kind of curious I actually kind of stumbled into it just by chance because again my brother so he used to be an undertaker Mm -hmm. weirdly and sometimes you get ex-firefighters and stuff like that or ex-army like people that used to work in any kind of service then going into undertaking so he worked with a guy who is, used to be a firefighter or something and on the side as kind of like a bit of a side hobby hustle thing he worked in the film industry as like an on-set firefighter so the guys that are like just responsible for making sure nothing blows up or sets on on fire and for the most part is just sitting around doing nothing and he was uh telling my brother oh you know like there's all sorts of jobs in the film industry you can do like you know you can do, get into like extra work and background work and stuff like that you can do like body doubling and and then my brother was telling me about it and so yeah I ended up doing a little bit of research and applied to an agency and then got a few agents and and then got into it like that so I kind of you know I went for it because I just thought it was different and it was interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd been like working in retail and doing just normal jobs that teenagers do. I mean, I got into it when I was like 18, 19. Mm -hmm. So I was quite young and ended up actually getting fired from that retail job. Um, (laughs) I think I was, yeah, never really destined to be an employee or employed by anyone. (laughs) I've definitely uh, always been kind of like, like to do things on my own terms. And I'm not, I'm not like a bad, you know, you know, when you hear that someone's been fired, I'm not like a bad person or I would like, I was like really yeah, good yeah. at the job, but then I would just like not turn up to a shift and stuff. Cause I was just all over the place. And like me and my friend always joke that like creative people are more likely to be time blind and like just completely mm. oblivious to the time of the real world. Cause they're just living in this bubble of creativity. <laughs> and so, yeah, like I ended up just getting into that and doing some really cool, fun projects and films and stuff until... I decided to become a teacher, but yeah, everything happens for a reason. And I always sort of say when I worked in the film industry, I absolutely loved it. And coming out of that and not doing that anymore was almost like a little taster of what it's like to have something that you love and Mm -hmm. not do it anymore. And so I had the teaching, which kind of taught me all about, you know, this is what it's like to do a job that you really don't want to do and Mm -hmm. you're exhausted and stressed all the time. And then I had the film and it was like, this is what it's like to do something you love and then have it taken away. Mm -hmm. And so both of those combined kind of made for the perfect catalyst for starting a career in the arts because I thought, you know what? I don't want this to ever end. I don't want to have it taken away from me. And I don't want to have to go back and do a job that makes me stressed and exhausted. So yeah, I'm so grateful for both of those things. Yeah, I think you have to live those things too. You know, I feel like I've gone back and forth over the years and there is sort of that social pressure of, yeah, you need to just, why don't you just get a normal job like everyone else? Can't Mm. you just be normal? And, you know, I think I've struggled with it where I would kind of go all in on 
trying to pursue my passion. And sometimes that can, you know, might not be the best financial decision. But then, you know, when you start to doubt yourself, you can kind of be pushed by whether it's your family or friends or society, people that, you know, often mm-hmm. are just trying to look out for your best interests yeah. in their mind. But, you know, I, I've taken more normal jobs at different times too, and then kind of regretted it because oh, I'm like, oh, financially, yeah, I'm doing a little better and more stable. But then that kind of like, it's like a slow creeping, mm-hmm. I don't know, death might be extreme, but it just, <laughs> yeah. you know, it starts to, you, you kind of lose that thing that really lit you up. Yeah, totally. I think this is the problem. Like most people tend to have Mm. a little bit of a clash of like heart and heart and brain, like their brain's telling them Mm -hmm. to be sensible and it's trying to protect them, but then their heart is telling them something else. And I think when your heart and your brain line up, that's when the magic happens. And I think sometimes it is about sort of surrounding yourself with people that support you no matter what. Like I, you know, I've got friends now that whenever I come up with some ridiculous idea of something that I want to do they never question it they're just kind of like yeah sounds great yeah. you know even if deep down they're thinking that sounds like it's gonna fail or <laughs> that sounds ridiculous so they just go along with it and then ends up being some cool fun thing that I do mm. yeah you, I think you need that especially early on in a, in a project to just have people encourage you and you'll kind of figure it out like if it's not something you want to do after a few weeks that urge or desire will kind of fade away but if if it is then uh, you'll you'll find a way to do it if it's something you're really connected to. Mm. In terms of the when you were a part of the film world, do you have any takeaways that maybe influence your current creative life or what you're pursuing? Other than you know, you said it was kind of a realization that you lost something that you were connected to in in a stronger way than teaching. But I don't know if there's any takeaways from that experience being on set and interacting with other folks. Yeah, being on film sets. In general, you tend to be surrounded by people that are kind of like-minded and and interesting and have their own creative vision. And often you'll get people that are working in the film industry as like a bridge to doing something else. Like you'll get people that are doing like AD work or they're like runners, but they want to be directors or they want to be producers. Or you'll get like people that, you know, have written their own script on the side and stuff like that. And they're just working as crew to get a bit of experience. So you you meet so many cool, interesting people. And I think because I started doing it so young, I was like nine, 18, I think, when I first started that, I, it did teach me how to kind of connect with people from all walks of life and kind of hanging out on set with people that I probably wouldn't normally ever come across in in life. You know, I think generally we tend to kind of go through school and education and have our friends and our set of friends in that world. And then that's that you know we go to work come home spend weekends with those people and and you never sort of broaden your horizons really in Mm. terms of like who you're connecting with but yeah I sort of learned quite early on how to kind of form connections and talk to people and again I built up my confidence a lot I was still you know kind of recovering from this like mutism phase of my life and I was still quite shy and I remember like working on films I kind of like got forced out of my comfort zone there were times when I got I had to sort of when I was standing in I had to do what they call like offlines where the camera crew are like filming on an actor or an actress and they're having a conversation with somebody that's like off screen and so you will read mm. the lines of the other character for them to respond to while they're being filmed on so you're kind of forced to like read lines with like these huge celebrities and actors and stuff and yeah, it was like a couple of times when the pressure was insane. And, and I remember there was a time when like I got really, really shouted at by this director and I won't obviously name names, <laughs> but he was kind of difficult to understand. Like he was giving me a cue and it was hard to like read the cue and I couldn't mm-hmm. read the cue and the AD that was with me couldn't read the cue. So we were just kind of looking at each other like, what's, what's he doing? You know, he was just <laughs> kind of like a, it's a nice way of putting it. It was just different. It was just a different, <laughs> different sort of person. Anyway, yeah. I ended up getting like yeah. massively shouted at. It was literally like no uh, exaggeration, geez. like a couple of weeks or something after my mum had died, and I was just like tearing up on set. And for like a nineteen-year-old, that's quite that's quite uh, intense kind of situation to be in. So it definitely forced me to sort of um, yeah, like build up my confidence, get to know different people, and and I think that stuck with me through life and and show me Mm. what's out there you know life is just so interesting and there's so much going on in the world that we just don't know about yeah 
Yeah, it's such an interesting world, the film world. I, I lived in LA for a couple of years and worked mostly in camera on mostly indie features. And it's like a very high pressure, high stakes situation because there's so much money involved. And yeah, there's a lot of interesting mm -hmm. personalities. There's a lot of really great people, but then you get some of those <laughs> people that are a little strange or their egos have gotten really inflated or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then there's that extra layer of tension because they're in the room and no one knows what they're going to say. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it's an exciting world to be a part of for sure. Yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's an exciting environment to be in for sure. Mm -hmm. So back to the painting where we really want to spend some time you know, how did you, you know, coming out of the the teaching and starting to really push towards doing the work that you're connected to, I guess, what is, what were you really connected to at that time? And, and maybe that's developed over time. And how did you, I don't know if there was a way that you were consciously developing your skills or the types of work or your artistic eye at that time, you know, what was going on in those first couple of years after making that decision to move to the art world? Yeah, so I'd say the first couple of years were really about sort of feeling into my personal style and like what made me tick. And, and I think with a lot of creatives and like self-employed people in general or anyone that's sort of selling a creation, there's always this kind of struggle with, you know, do I paint what I love? Do I paint what I'm passionate about? Do I paint what I think will sell? And so for a while I was kind of doing the commissions and then on the side I was trying to think of what would sell and was like, oh, I could do these little drawings and then sell that, you know. And and then I was kind of getting confused and all the while I was practicing and like experimenting with different things and I did lots of drawings and then I did some like chalk pastel pieces and and I was like experimenting with different styles. And all this time I was always improving my technique and kind of like working on my art as a whole and my skill. So I was definitely improving and it was worth it. What I learned was that it very quickly, when you focus on what's going to sell or you focus on selling the work and you have very little like sort of passion or love for what you're actually doing, then it's less likely to sell anyway. Whereas if you're sort of like doing what you love because you love it and you're putting passion in, into it and, and love into it, someone's going to you know, some that is going to sort of shine through to somebody at least, and you will end up selling your work and, you know, financially it will, it will be okay. But yeah, that, that was definitely a learning curve for me at the time. I was definitely doing lots of different bits and pieces. And sometimes I look back on my work now uh, from back then and I'm like, oh God, I hope no one ever sees that because it's just awful. <laughs> like I've never sees the light of day. And there are people out there that have like my prints from the early days and sometimes someone will post on like Twitter or something and be like oh look I've got one of your prints and it's one of the ones that I like hate because <laughs> it's so old I'm like oh god I hope no one sees that <laughs> but yeah no it was all it was all good good journey though mm. yeah I mean I think that's that's pretty common too where people you're kind of juggling between do I just go into what I really like or you know you want you want to have that break from maybe whatever you're doing now to being able to do this full time. So it's, it's easy to think maybe I should try to figure out what's selling so I can mm. make some money and then make that transition. But I think it's kind of a dangerous path to take because if you do become successful or really successful in that way, making things that you think sell, then you might just end up kind of doing what you were saying earlier is what feels more like a job. And you feel like you have to do this certain type of work to make the money mm. now because you're kind of trapped in this lane so yeah totally. yeah it's, it's great that you kind of found your way early on in that process mm, yeah because you'll burn out I mean like it's so easy to burn out when you're self-employed anyway no matter what you're doing or how much you love what you're doing it's so easy you feel like you're on a treadmill like constantly trying to keep your head above water and constantly trying to uh, make rent make money and stuff and and it's hard like it does put pressure on and so people when the pressure is on do tend to sort of like suddenly just you know decide to do what they think is going to sell or try some huge new experiment because they think that that's what's gonna you know make the money but yeah mm. yeah how do you you know maybe this is maybe it's not so much now but early on how did you kind of push that stuff out of your mind and get into the zone i guess more talking about your process you know how do you get into that zone where you just flow and what's that feel like to you you know when when you're in it and creating what are you connected to in that moment 
Well, on a good day, it starts <laughs> off, you know, with the the seed of an idea and it kind of starts off, I get this sort of, almost like a rush of excitement and like a rush of inspiration. And and yeah, like it, it usually it's like an idea that comes and then I suddenly feel, yeah, super inspired and, and excited to do something. And then I start to do, you know, the prep work and stuff. And then I start the painting and, and slowly that kind of gradually starts to fade often with me. And then suddenly it becomes like a normal nine to five job. And that's when I have to just force myself <laughs> to sit down in front of the, the canvas and paint. It's not always like this really inspired, creative, like Zen um, space you know, in my <laughs> studio where I'm like always creating something and always feeling really like inspired and passionate and motivated. Like sometimes I literally am dragging my heels and I have to just sit down and paint because it is my job. But yeah, it's once you get started, you find yourself sort of losing track of time and, you know, you haven't paid attention to anything around you for a long time. You haven't checked your phone. Like that's a big, big indicator mm. for me that I'm kind of in the flow because I haven't like checked social media or my emails or anything for a while. And then, yeah, like I normally put some music on or a podcast and just zone out for hours and hours and yeah, and then just paint and paint and paint. Obviously, I also have to kind of like create social media content and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that kind of comes into it too. Those days where I'm recording, because I don't always record, but the days when I'm recording myself painting, those are the days that I'm like the least in the flow because I have to keep like getting up and sorting the camera out and stuff like that. Whereas, yeah, like the days where I'm just painting, those are, those are my fave. Yeah, I was going to go into that a little bit later, but since you brought it up, I'm curious, you know, the, the social media side, the business side, was that a realization early on, a conscious decision that you were going to, you know, do posting on social media? I feel like Instagram is really great for this type of work. And also just, you know, what aspects of that business side were you developing and maybe have paid off? Yeah, so I think we're really lucky, obviously, to have social media nowadays and to have this like free platform to reach, you know, people all over the world. And I started off as an artist like relatively late in life. Like I wasn't, you know, if I had started off being an artist when I was sort of 18, 19, straight out of college, it would have been a completely different world. And social media hadn't really taken off at that point, if at all. So I actually, when I first started painting, social media was already like you know in full swing and everyone was using it for their businesses so for me it was a kind of no-brainer to use that so I set my page up and from day one I had expectations of what I was going to use it for and so you know it wasn't like I ever used it for like a personal account and I had pictures of like my food or family and <laughs> friends and stuff and had to like gradually start posting pictures of my art it was always from day one like putting out content and and I think as time's gone on I've just learned more about like how the camera works and how to light a shot and how to, to record video footage and use Premiere Pro to edit and stuff like that and it's almost become as much of a passion for me as the art because I just enjoy like curating a page of content and edit editing footage and stuff for me it's like part of the creation and I've always enjoyed that sort of thing anyway so yeah it's fun for me but I understand that it's not fun for everybody and social media is a chore for many and it can be taxing and difficult but it's a great tool so yeah I think for me the the part that's tough is even though I feel like I in my mind, I'm, I tell myself I have more discipline than this. It's just so easy to get sucked into it. And mm. I, I don't know how you deal with that, if it's a problem or if you just naturally can kind of post and step away. But yeah, what's yeah. that relationship like? I mean, it's difficult because you never kind of want to just post and step away anyway, because you do want to engage with the people that are on your page and engaging with your posts and you want to engage back. And, you know, it's called social media for a reason. It's not like <laughs> anti-social media. So it's there to be <laughs> sociable. Point. And I think this is a problem. Like some people, they do just post and then they like turn their phones off and then they wonder why no one's engaging with, with their posts. It's because they're not really engaging with anyone else. So, you know, so I do enjoy going on and like looking down my timeline and seeing what people are posting and engaging with their posts and then replying to messages and comments and stuff like that for me that's it's quite nice because obviously I spend a lot of time in the studio alone so it's quite nice to just read some comments from other people for a bit um, but I have been quite strict with who I kind of follow so I have my art page and I don't really follow any of my 
friends or family or any like influencers or anything that's just not related to like wildlife or wildlife mm. photography or wildlife art or art like those are the only things that I really follow so I don't get sucked into the rabbit hole so much when I'm on my Instagram because it's just all work stuff like I'm going down my timeline and it's all just pictures of animals and stuff so for me it's actually inspiring and it's just like work but yeah I think if you haven't already I would definitely cull the people that you're following or like at least just <laughs> mute them because you know yeah. if you're getting sucked into like looking at reels of like it's random people dancing and stuff that's just like such a waste of time and if you take all the time that people spend just scrolling through their phones in the evening and think like if you put all of that time and energy into like learning a language or like reading a book or something then everybody would be in such a better place in their lives i think yeah really really great advice and i need to take some of that so thank you uh <laughs> no, no it's Welcome. it can be it can be difficult you can get sucked in easy but you do an amazing job and I, I don't think i realized at first that you were making all of those videos you know displaying your work and yourself painting and yeah really well done and it just uh it gives everyone another way to engage with what you're doing so super cool going back to your your painting itself can you talk a little bit about the style i mean people can go and look at your work online on instagram and your website and get prints and stuff but just you know i i I've read a little bit i'm not very well versed in painting i kind of skipped out on some of those classes as well mm -hmm. but hyper i know hyper realize realism is what mm -hmm. a lot of people call your style and maybe you can just describe that a little bit for other people yeah so essentially my artwork kind of is painted almost to look like photos and yeah, it is what it is. It's, it's re very realistic. It's not kind of impressionistic or abstract in any way. And then, you know, you always get people that are sort of like, well, why do you paint them then? Like, why don't you just take photos? But I think that the thing that photorealistic and hyperrealistic art can contribute to the world is that you can kind of create these animals that look super, super realistic, but you can kind of do whatever you want with them. You can have them looking in a certain way or like posing in a certain way, or you can change up the lighting or the coloring and the values and stuff like that. And so you almost have the power to kind of manipulate the situation. So yeah, it kind of act as a little bit of a bridge between like photography and real life, because you, you can create this painting that makes it feel you know feel like you're looking at the animal but then you can use the art to sort of tell a story and evoke invoke a certain emotion or make something somebody think of something or feel a certain way so yeah that's that's kind of like my style of artwork it's paintings that look like real animals yeah and i mean just looking at some of the pieces in the impermanence collection you know it's just being able to isolate them as well with you know these dark backgrounds and just these stunning faces like that again going back to that wild dog the watcher mm. it's just looking into their eyes and it just it draws you in and you feel the character of the the animal and some kind of emotion which i think is really important so when you're when you're creating these are you using photos as inspiration and then sometimes you know kind of developing little changes to create that emotion i mean obviously you know, most of these animals probably aren't taken on black backgrounds, the pictures. <laughs> so there's there's part of that in the setting. But in terms of, you know, you said kind of manipulating the way they're posed or looking, mm. just what's, what's your process with that as you're developing? Yeah, so sometimes it starts with the photo might inspire me. Often it's the other way around. So I've come up with an idea or a concept or something, and then I kind of like look for photos that will help me create that. So it might be a photo or it could be like a bunch of photos and I sort of create a composite kind of reference picture. And sometimes it's other people's photography. Sometimes it's photos that I've taken myself. There's one piece in the impermanence collection called Thin Ice 2 that was, I actually took this as a photo and it was kind of like, a, I, I basically, we were in the Arctic and I just like leant over the edge of the boat and there was a polar bear kind of walking from one bit of pack ice to the next. And it was just a really cool composition. So I thought, oh, that'd be a great picture to paint. So that one was inspired by the picture and the moment itself. But for the most part, they kind of come out of out of my head and uh, onto the canvas and mm -hmm. it's usually sort of the story that I want to tell the emotion that I want to invoke and 
And often it's sort of like a theme of conservation. So impermanence was mostly a collection of animals kind of coming out of the darkness, which for me was like quite symbolic. And impermanence itself was quite an ambiguous sort of concept. And it was all about sort of the impermanence of the wildlife and the species and the ecosystems, which are kind of being destroyed all around us, but also potentially like the impermanence of the, you know, the problems as well. So it, two sides of, of the same coin. And yeah, so that collection was all animals coming out of the darkness. And so I kind of found some photos that I could use and then edited them myself or, you know, whatever that might be to make it look like that. And then, uh, yeah, and then my next collection, which I'm going to be starting in the next few months, is going to be something completely different. So mm, That sounds really exciting. Yeah, for this for this collection, Impermanence, I mean, yeah, the name is it's such a great name for this collection because I feel like even just the impermanence of life or being or, you know, the universe, everything is just always kind of changing and moving, which is, yeah, yeah. you can kind of go deep with, with that thought. And mm. I'm, I'm also just struck by, you know, especially watching some of these videos you've created of yourself painting, it's just like the detail of the hairs or, you know, the skin. And it's just... It's, it's mind blowing that you can even do that with paint to canvas in that kind of detail and just also kind of mind blowing and like imagining how much time it takes to create that. I don't know if you can talk to that at all. And, you know, really, really going deep into this style of this, you know, hyper realistic, especially mm. with wildlife and, and creating these textures. Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the piece and the size and the composition. I get asked a lot how long a piece takes and mm. It really depends. I mean, I try to leave a month for like the medium sized pieces, the large pieces, a couple of months. But then sometimes, for example, if I've got a really tight deadline, I can do it in much, much less. But it really means like painting for hours and hours and hours on end. And I have kind of like tendonitis in my wrist from so much painting and playing <laughs> tennis over the years. So I uh, try not to do too much of that. But yeah, the I mean, the Impermanence Collection, it was 14 pieces however I think it was 11 originals and I started it when I got back from the Arctic which was September 2021 so it took me like a year and a year and two months to complete the collection and that was 11 pieces so yeah I would say they were averaging about a month and a bit per painting but yeah I, yeah. I essentially create depth and realism through just adding lots and lots of layers I use acrylic paint rather than oil so I use a very very high quality acrylic paint and it dries very quickly so I'm quite lucky in that I can work very quickly and the way that I work is by layering up very very quickly and so I'm able to kind of get the speed which might not be quite as easy if I was working in oils and sort of work waiting for paint to dry for months and stuff. I mean, I, I haven't seen one of these pieces up close, but because of the acrylics, is is there also actually some texture to the, the painting itself with the paint? Sometimes. I mean, not hugely, to be honest with you. The Thin Eyes 2, the polar bear piece that I was just talking about, I actually used like a molding paste with that one because I wanted to get the texture of the pack ice. And that was like, the pack ice was really part of the part of the piece. It was part of the story because on the one hand, you've got the piece of pack ice that the bear is like walking onto. It was like fresh, thick snow and ice. And then the piece of ice that it was walking off of was sort of like thin, really sort of like melting into the sea. And there was po like polar bear prints as well. So I wanted to use the molding paste to kind of make it almost three dimensional. But for the most part, I think my paintings are actually quite smooth. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse my naivete when it comes to that kind of stuff, but it's, it's really fascinating to learn about it. And then, you know, connecting this to conservation, I think you know, that's a big part of this impermanence collection, but can you talk about how that developed? I don't know if, if it was around the same time you decided to go all in on this type of work or how did you decide to connect your art to conservation and conservation projects? Yeah. So I, again, I think it was quite organic. I think the more my artwork kind of honed in more on like wildlife and the species that I was personally interested in painting, the more it kind of uh, came to my attention, all of the issues that the species are facing. And, uh, you know, when you're kind of in the echo chamber of anything, it's all you hear about and you, you know, you're just inundated with just like really sad facts about animals and 
stories of like poaching and hunting and climate crisis and stuff like that. And so, you know, when I first started as an artist, I always knew that I wanted to donate a certain percentage of my income to like animal charities and like make a difference in that way and so I started off sort of donating to more like animal specific like the RSPCA and Dogs Trust which are like like pet charities or pet rescue and stuff like that Uh, and then as my artwork evolved more into sort of like wildlife and it was more focused on the natural world it kind of made sense to donate a percentage to uh, conservation charities and and wildlife charities and so that's how it started it was literally just me donating a small percentage it was usually like 10 percent of my profits to these charities and then as the years went on I kind of developed quite good relationships with these charities and and that sort of evolved into doing you know painting donations and auctions and I ended up for the impermanence collection, I ended up setting up uh, a project fund myself so that I could choose projects from different charities to donate uh, 30% Mm -hmm. of the money to and stuff like that. And yeah, I've been sort of involved with various different charity initiatives like the Young Conservationist Awards and the Youth Sketch for Survival, which is the competition for children that Explorers Against Extinction run. I'm sort of like one of the judges with that and I hosted the Wildlife Artist of the Year competition last year with the David Shepherd Wildlife Foundation which was awesome and hosted the youth art competition through IFOR which is the International Fund for Animal Welfare and stuff like that so it's just opened lots of doors and I've just sort of become more and more involved with various different conservation charities and it's just something that I love and it's great because when you're kind of in the echo chamber of conservation and you're just hearing all this negative stuff constantly it's just so heartwarming to then be part of this really positive world of conservation and and making a difference and seeing, you know, the next generation of people as well that are getting involved too. Yeah. Maybe you could talk a little bit more to hope because I I think I've read and maybe listened to you talking about, you know, kind of the sense of there's a lot of despair around climate change and loss of biodiversity and even even with myself and and our film rhino man following the rangers and being on the front line of the rhino poaching crisis it can be really tough for a lot of the folks that are doing this work too because you're just constantly seeing death and loss and you know even lives threatened and and human lives being taken because of this stuff but i think it's important and and we've even tried to infuse this into the film that there is hope otherwise you know everyone's (laughs) It just becomes, it feels futile, you know, but yeah. but you do see a lot of the positive change that's happening. And the, I think the passion in a lot of folks that are involved in these projects, even in the face of a lot of challenge, really inspires me at least to want to continue and, and find a way to help in different ways. So yeah, can you talk to, to Hope and your work and maybe just to you personally why it's important? Yeah, I mean, from a personal perspective, it's essentially just how I work in you know in my own life I think that like great things can happen when you look at life through a more optimistic lens and yeah I've always kind of been put off by like an aggressive more guilt trippy type of stance in terms of like getting people to change Mm. their behavior and that's just a personal preference like everybody's different I think it probably comes down to people's like upbringing and stuff like that I've never really liked that sort of thing and so for me I just can only speak for myself when I say that the most lasting and sustainable change that has come in my own personal life has come off the back of feeling like hopeful and inspired and and more positive whereas the stuff that I feel negative about I might make some like short-term reactive changes and then it never really lasts and so going you know into my art I've always tried to kind of bring that element into my art as well and so yeah a lot of my art is isn't is you know it's not like heartbreaking or shocking or evocative in that sense but it is quite nice to look at but it also as I said before it also sort of tells a story so yeah I've always been quite kind of outspoken about that I'm just sort of I'm just a big fan of sort of looking at the positive side of life as well and as you say you know you can feel so inspired by seeing someone's sort of strength and in the face of adversity and like so much horror that's in the world at the moment it's the people that are sort of really doing good things and making a difference that I think are so inspiring and yeah in terms of like the climate crisis and stuff like that there's 
really not huge amounts that like the individual person can do apart from like lifestyle changes and and you know obviously who you vote for is hugely important as well and you know who you buy products from as a consumer and stuff like that but i think on an individual level it's so counter productive to like make people feel bad and just apathetic about the world because then we might as well just all give up whereas if you're kind of inspiring people and showing people how beautiful the natural world is and trying to connect people with the natural world then feel like they're more likely to kind of try to make a difference in some way rather than just say oh wow like the world's the world's a mess like there's no point kind of thing. <laughs> yeah i mean i think your art just really draws people into that world and the beauty of nature and yeah, like what you said, it's just, I'm kind of averse to that type of shock factor, you know, get you to change the way you see the world and versus bring you into a world and then people fall in love with it. And then from, you know, within decide that they want to do what they can to to protect it in their own way. Yeah, exactly. And I think also, you know, nobody's perfect and I'm very much coming at the sub you know i'm coming at the problem from the perspective of somebody that isn't perfect and and hasn't always known what's right and and even you know like i've spoken before about you know things in the past that have happened like when i was a kid i like swam with dolphins because back then we didn't really know or understand like how terrible those sorts of places were and like for me it was just you know i love animals so we did that and so now i obviously know better i would never you know, ridicule someone or guilt trip someone or make someone feel small for doing something like that, because I'm coming from the perspective of someone that has also been ignorant at one point and we're all Mm -hmm. ignorant until we're not, you know, I've never, for example, I've never been a smoker. And so I don't really have much patience for people that are addicted to smoking, but somebody that has been addicted to smoking and understands how easy it is to be addicted to it and to get into that lifestyle. And then quits is more likely to have compassion and understanding for somebody else that is still smoking so i think it's just kind of you know looking at life as like nobody's perfect nobody knows everything and so all we can do is our best and all we can do is kind of try to inspire others to do better as well yeah it's a really great perspective i think too many people are quick to judge and like you said i mean everyone we're humans we grow i mean that's a part of being human we all make mistakes we all have the ability to change and i think i think you see a lot of times in in media and sometimes social media people getting criticized for something they did 10 15 years ago i Mm -hmm. mean i I feel like i'm lucky and kind of like you're saying you know we grew up at a time where social media wasn't as big but if if i put every one of my mistakes on social media from like 12 through Mm. 20 i'd probably you know be ridiculed for the rest of my life you gotta allow for people to grow yeah yeah and like what's offensive is also so different like this is a completely different topic but like one thing that some you know is quite commonplace to say like a phrase or whatever and then it becomes offensive like it doesn't necessarily mean that it was always okay to say that but like public perception changes and then like you know i i can't think of anything like terrible that i've ever done but like i'm sure there's stuff that i like did or said or posted when i was a teenager that i'm like oh my god i i don't even want to think about that like now you know once you're sort of like vaguely in the public eye it's absolutely terrifying like i can't imagine how terrifying it must be for people that are like hugely famous to know that at any point they could be like publicly (laughs) shamed and you know cancelled but yeah yeah it's a strange world we live in we just need to be kinder and more open to to Mm, people's journey through life you know i want to talk a little bit about travel because it feels like that's something that has probably influenced your work you were talking about the the polar bear painting and also you're doing some travel trips so i'm kind of curious what those are and and why you decided to do that so maybe start out Mm. how you how travel has just influenced you over the years yeah so travel's always been a huge part of my life and i've i absolutely love travel and you know i was saying earlier that like creation and nature have always been a huge part of who i am at an authentic level and travel has always been one another one of those things and obviously you know when you work in the conservation world it's difficult because obviously travel isn't always great for the environment you know, planes and stuff like that are not good for the environment. So 
I personally, like in my day to day life, I don't think I could be any more environmentally friendly. You know, like I don't eat plant, I don't eat uh, animal products. I sort of live literally in like a wooden cabin in the woods. <laughs> you know, I never really leave the house. So I'm hardly traveling. <laughs> outside of my own house <laughs> however i do love to travel and so obviously with my my job as well i i do sometimes try to to see the animals in in real life um it just massively impacts the way i'm able to work and so if i can like see the animals in their natural environment and see the animals kind of interacting with other animals and stuff like that it just makes the artwork a lot stronger for me personally but I'm a big fan of sort of encouraging others to sort of engage with the natural world and and travel and see different cultures and learn about different cultures and stuff like that as well if they can in as an environmentally friendly way as possible I'm very conscious of like carbon footprints and stuff like that so yeah I would never sort of travel just to take one picture of one animal and then you know that be that kind of thing but yeah the trip that I took to the arctic in september that that was initially to photograph the wildlife and i did get many many photos of polar bears and walruses and arctic foxes and stuff like that that i plan on using not just in artwork but in other projects that i've got in the pipeline as well so that's great i also learned a lot on that trip and it inspired the entire impermanence collection and the impermanence exhibition and then raised I think I don't even know what figure we're on yet, but the amount of money that was raised for conservation projects is, you know, it's like five figures. So for me, it was worth it. And it's, yeah, it's just shaped who I, who I am and how I view the world. We're taking a small group of people out this year to Costa Rica and to the Galapagos Islands just to visit some of the islands that, you know, that aren't protected, obviously. Uh, and yeah, and we just we're hoping to kind of inspire people and to connect people with the wildlife and the nature out there. And I'm so excited. It's I mean, I've never been to Costa Rica or the Galapagos Islands yet. So very much looking forward to like exploring what's out there. And I'll be taking pictures and stuff as well for my art. But also we'll be taking a group out to kind of learn about conservation out there as well. So, yeah, it's great. I love it. Those sound like really exciting trips. I, I feel like everyone that I've talked to that's ever been to Costa Rica or the Galapagos Islands says you have to go. It's just an amazing mm. experience. So, oh, yeah, yeah, me too. I've heard that yeah. as well. I feel like I'm not going to want to come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just a little jealous, but that's that's really exciting. And I think it's such a balance, like you were saying, you know, watching your carbon footprint and in trying to do it in a responsible way, but then also you know, being in South Africa a lot and, and looking at a lot of these conservation projects and seeing the impacts that COVID had on shutting down tourism. It's, you know, I guess it's a, you kind of have to find that balance in your life because if you're doing it right, it actually is supporting a lot of these conservation efforts, the tourism mm. and seeing these places. So trying to, to find that. Yeah. Some of these countries really like survive off of tour. I mean, like the Ecuador and the Galapagos Islands, they, the tourism, yeah, it's, it's difficult because I mean, I know that some of the places in the Galapagos Islands are protected and, and it's not great to have boats going around there and stuff, but also the the locals kind of live off of the environmental tourism and stuff like that. So yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, but also it's not like I'm kind of flying out to go on ski trips or like lion, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going out there to sort of learn about other countries, learn about other cultures, learn about wildlife. And then my view is as long as I sort of leave a place in a better, in a, you know, in a better state than when I went there, even if that's just through sort of like donating money to a charity out there or whatever it might be, then I feel like it's, you know, it's okay. And that's, it's there to be enjoyed kind of thing. No, it sounds, it sounds really wonderful. And do you have any questions that you wish people would ask you? Because I feel like you've been doing a lot of these interviews, mm -hmm. interacting with a lot of people online. Is there a question that you just feel like enough, not enough people are asking that you'd love to give the answer to? I don't know if anything pops to your mind. Um, not necessarily any questions. I mean, I feel like people are always asking great questions. I honestly feel like, I mean, it's completely unrelated. Well, actually, it's not so unrelated to this topic, but there are a couple of things that I feel really passionate about that aren't really spoken much about in the art world. And that is a, the, the place that wildlife art fits into the, like the art industry as a whole. 
and its reputation and then also the same with women in art so the sort of the way that women are perceived in the art industry the amount of money that women make in the art industry compared to men and stuff like that so those are two things i'm not really like asked about often but also i just don't think they're really spoken about that often i think women and underrepresented people are starting to be spoken about a little bit more in the art industry but not enough and as for wildlife art and animal art I just don't think it's really respected in the art you know in the the wider art world for whatever reason it's probably one of the like oldest forms of art we've always had animals and wildlife depicted in art all the way back to sort of like cave drawings and stuff and yet it's not really seen as sort of like blue chip good modern art that's gonna you know change the world and i'd like that to change because i in my opinion it's probably one of the most important forms of art because Hmm. you know the natural world is kind of all we have and without the natural world and without wildlife and ecosystems we literally would not be here so a bit of a celebration of that would be nice i think (laughs) yeah it's it's really interesting what the art world decides is you know, Mm. highbrow art or whatever. It's, it's a very strange world, I think, when it comes to that. But like you said, it's definitely, yeah, this it's, I mean, it's some of the most beautiful art. Uh, I mean, some of your works are just completely stunning and just draw you into this whole world, this natural world that we have around us. And yeah, it it definitely should be held at a higher standard. I don't know what the ways we can go about changing Mm. that as a society, but yeah, it's, it's very, very valuable. Yeah. I mean, I guess on a personal, in a personal way, it's, I just aim to change that through focusing on my own art and trying to sort of pave the way and work alongside other amazing artists who are also trying to do the same. Yeah, I guess like with wildlife art, it's less conceptual than some other types of art because obviously modern art nowadays, there's always some sort of modern concept behind the whole thing. And I guess sometimes wildlife art can be a bit simple in that sense and it it literally is just a picture of an animal. But I feel like through using sort of conservation issues and stuff like that you know we're able to create a concept and have a slightly more conceptual edge to wildlife art yeah it's a it's like you know the art is a part of a bigger story that you're trying to tell an impact you're trying to have which i I kind of feel that with our film you know it's we're creating a social impact campaign and, and there's a lot of things that are going on outside of the film itself so yeah it's kind of seeing that as a whole a whole piece or totally. project versus just the art, which is also extremely important. But yeah, I, I feel like we're getting close to the end here. I, I want to ask you if you just have any advice for someone that's trying to follow their passion or getting into the art world, something that can maybe help inspire them or give them a little bit of direction. Yeah, I would say just always having sort of a, a bigger why like a bigger reason and a bigger purpose rather than just I want to be an artist so that I can paint every day because I feel like that probably won't be very sustainable and is just like a burnout waiting to happen I think (laughs) having like a a greater purpose like why am I actually doing this how can I make the world a better place how can I change the world in some small way I feel like that's just personally what's helped me to like keep keep on going when times get tough or when, you know, if you're not earning much money in the beginning and stuff like that. And, you know, for me, that was the conservation stuff. And it was the animals. Every time I paint an animal, I'm thinking about the actual animal that I might be helping in some, you know, somewhere in the world out there. Like one of the projects that we did or that we supported actually through the impermanence project fund was a snow leopard safeguarding project and so I included a snow leopard in the collection and it was maybe one of my favorite pieces in the collection in the end but it you know it was a nice painting but it also was more like the reasoning behind Mm -hmm. it is that I was painting a snow leopard but somewhere out there we're going to be actually doing research projects on real snow leopards to track sort of like the effects of climate change on their habitats and stuff so it just had more meaning and i would always encourage people to actually like get clear on what their purpose is before they embark on something um you know super creative like that because it will just keep you grounded and stable throughout that's my personal opinion yeah i think it connected to that is kind of having something to say which i guess is a part of what your purpose is and if you don't have anything to say it's hard to yeah. create anything <laughs> that that doesn't feel shallow or just you know, like a you know something that's just a yeah. fluff piece or ephemeral 
so yeah, just having something to say, having a purpose you're connected to makes a huge difference and I'm sure gives you energy as you're creating it. Yeah, I think like as humans, we're quite often preoccupied with like what people think about us and what, you know, how a piece is going to sell or how it's going to land, like what people are going to say about it. And like even like with podcasts, like what is everyone going to think and stuff like that. But if you kind of have someone that you want to help or a species that you want to help or some way that you want to contribute to the world and you focus on that like for example doing this podcast you could very easily think about like what the masses are going to think of you or will it be a popular podcast or you know how many people will listen what would the stats be or you can just imagine like one person that's going to take something really useful away from it and then it's totally worth it and then yeah it just kind of separates you from the masses I think in that sense. Yeah, and, and thank you so much for doing this. It's It's been an, an absolute pleasure learning about your life and your art and your work with conservation. Uh, how could people follow you and you know come on the journey that you're creating? Yeah, so, well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. You can find me online. So my website is sophiegreenfineart.com, with green like the colour. Or uh, you can find me on Instagram on Sophie Green Fine Art or on Twitter, Sophie Green Art. You can come on Facebook as well, Sophie Green Fine Art. It's all pretty streamlined. Sophie Green Fine Art is the general thing to search for. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'm on all the socials and you can follow my journey and my art and be kept up to date when the next collection comes out and the exhibition's up and stuff like that. And we'll make sure to post all those links as well on our page. But yeah, it's, it's just worth going to to check out some of your work. And I think people will definitely want to follow along once they see what you're doing, if they haven't already. So yeah, thank you. I don't know if you have any final thoughts or words before I let you go. No, I don't think so. I think that's, we've covered everything. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks so much, Sophie. Thank you for listening to the Rhino Man podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you're excited to see the film succeed, please subscribe and review our podcast on Spotify and iTunes. Then follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Rhino Man the Movie. More details about Rhino Man, the social impact campaign, and future screenings are at rhinomanthemovie.org. To learn more about the Global Conservation Corps and their work, visit globalconservationcorps.org. Sign up for the newsletter and follow GCC on all of the social platforms. If you like this podcast, make sure to subscribe and catch up on GCC's Voices of Nature podcast, where Bob Ludke interviews a wide range of people who have dedicated their lives to making a difference in conservation. A special thanks goes out to Simone Wilson for the music for this podcast. He's the brilliant composer for Rhino Man the Movie. Learn more about his work at simonewilsonmusic.com. Until next time, I'm John Jerko, and this is the Rhino Man Podcast.